Praise the Lord. Wonderful to be together again. The Lord bless everyone tonight in Jesus' name. Let's close our eyes for prayer. Father, in the name of Jesus, we we'll bless your name. Thank you, Lord, for our brothers and our sisters and the faithfulness of always being in your presence, whatever the challenges might be. We're asking, Lord, Lord, as you use us in the kingdom of God to expand the kingdom and to bless the lives of your people. Your blessings will flow into our lives too in Jesus' name. We're asking, Lord, that today you will stir up your people. Help us to rise up once again in the strength of the Lord and do the work you have committed into our hands. Glorify yourself in every life. Let this work prosper in our hands together. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. God bless you. We're looking at Ezekiel chapter 3. Ezekiel chapter 3, I'm reading from verse 17. In verse 17 it says, Son of man, I have made thee a watchman unto the house of Israel. Therefore, hear the word at my mouth and give them a warning from me. Give them a exhortation from me. Give them a the message, the gospel from me. Here you find the Lord calling Ezekiel. Just like he has called you, called me and called us. And he says he's calling him to be a watchman over the whole house of Israel. That means over the whole nation. The men, the women, the young and the old, the lowly and the high, everyone in the nation. is saying to Ezekiel that Ezekiel will be a watchman over them and then he gives him what he was to do the details of the ministry the challenges they will face look at verse 18 it says when i say unto the wicked thou shalt surely die and thou givest him not warning nor speakest to warn the wicked from his wicked way to save his life the same wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood will I require at your hand. As you look at that verse, it tells you something. That those who might not have heard, those who have not been warned, those who did not hear the gospel, and those who did not live the life that qualifies us to get to heaven, they are still responsible. They cannot say, well, I wasn't told. They cannot say the watchman didn't get to me. They cannot say the evangelist didn't get to me. They will still be lost in their sin. But then the Lord told Ezekiel, although they will perish in their sin, in their wickedness, in their evil, yet their blood will I require at your hand. Which places something great, something terrific, a great responsibility upon you and upon me, upon everyone that is called to be a preacher, to be an evangelist in the household of faith. Look at verse 19. Yet if thou warn the wicked, and he turn not from his wickedness, nor turn from his wicked way, he shall die in his iniquity, but thou hast delivered thy soul. You know there are some people that will measure their faithfulness with their fruitfulness, and they will say, What's the point telling the people? What's the point preaching the gospel? What's the point going out and reaching out to them? I know they will not hear. I told them before they didn't hear. So what's the point? There's a great point here because God told Ezekiel, you tell them. You tell them. They are responsible for their decision. They are responsible for their response. Their response to the message, to the word of life. If you tell them and they do not hear and they do not repent and they do not bring the connection between them and the Almighty God, they will perish in their sin. But it says they've done something for you. You've been faithful. Though not fruitful, you've been faithful. Though they didn't accept the message, yet it says you have saved, you have delivered yourself. And again in verse 20 it says, When a righteous man does turn from his righteousness and commit iniquity, and I lay stumbling block before him, he shall die because thou hast not given him a warning. He shall die in his sin, and his righteousness which he has done shall not be remembered. 
but his blood will I require at your hand. You see something there, it's talking about number one, the wicked. Those are the people in the world. That is, you are reaching out to them, you are telling the laws, they need to repent, they need to turn. Then it comes to the righteous, those who are now in the church. They will save their children of God. And there are times that we watchmen, we believers, or we leaders, or we pastors, we do not balance up our ministry. We're out there going to the Lord. We're out there going to the wicked. We're out there going to the sinners, and then we neglect the saints. We neglect the children of God. We say they are born again already. They are righteous already. So what's the matter? Why should I even give any attention to them? It says, but the righteous man, he has temptation. He has trials. He has difficulty. He has challenges. And if in, in the time of those difficulties and challenges, if he turns away from his righteousness, and you are not warning him, you are not giving attention to him, you are not ministering to him, he will die in that backsliding. And if he dies in that condition, he perishes in his backsliding, but his blood will I require at your hand. He telling us to balance it up. Reach out to the sinners and then reach in here to the saints. Go after the laws and tell them they need to come to know the Lord as their personal Savior. And at the same time, you're talking to members and believers in the church. They ought to stay firm and endure until the very end. In verse 21, nevertheless, if thou warn the righteous man that the righteous sin not, that the righteous sin not, is it possible not to sin? I said, is it possible not to sin? Of course, yet. Neither do I condemn you now. You are forgiven. You are, you are converted. Go and sin no more. You have been made whole. Sin no more, lest it was sin upon unto you. We know that Jesus Christ, our Savior Redeemer, He was manifested as my take away our sin. And in Him is no sin. Whosoever is born of God does not commit sin. For his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin, he will not sin, because he is born of God. Hereby we know the children of God and the children of the devil. Those who practice righteousness, those who do righteousness, those are the children of God. Of course we can live without sin. If the Son therefore shall make you free, tell me the rest. It shall be freed. You'll be free in Jesus' name. Nevertheless, if thou want the righteous man, that the righteous sin not, and he does not sin, he shall surely live, because he is one, and also thou hast delivered thy soul. We are watchmen. Not only that, we are workmen. Not only that, we are workers together with God. And the, the work we have in us, awesome work, a great work, a glorious work. And yet it's so frightening when you think about it. To be entrusted with the souls of men is an awesome responsibility. God entrusts us with uh, the souls of never dying people. Or the souls of good, those who are going to spend eternity either on this side or on this other side. And the Lord is telling us what a great challenge and what a great ministry. And the, the word of God makes us understand will be held responsible for the destiny of the never dying souls. And that's the most glorious duty on the one hand. And yet it's fraught with frightening consequences. For you to think that those your neighbors, if they perish, that you are, you are going to have to give an answer to the Lord. That those your relatives, you see them every day, you talk to them every day, only you never talk about salvation, about conversion, about knowing the Lord. And it says that if they perish in their sins, you are going to answer the Lord for that. And those people that you brought to the Lord, they were converted through you, and yet you never tell them how they will remain in the Lord. And they steadfast in the Lord. The Lord says in the backslide, it's not just that, well, they are not serious, they don't mean business, and they are not responding. Because of your own carelessness, it says you have a question to answer because it required their blood at your hand. Think about that. A watchman to save or to lose souls. Think about that. A workman 
to preach or to pervert the word of God. Think about that, a worker, a worker together with God. And this great responsibility that he lays upon our shoulders, he says we need to be up and doing. We need to do what he has called us to do, lest judgment will come upon us. We're looking in at uh, 2 Timothy chapter 2, I'm reading from verse 15. 2 Timothy chapter 2, we're looking at verse 15, is this study to show thyself approved unto God a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Study, be diligent, make all the effort necessary, be fervent about it, and be dutiful, and do everything that needs to be done. Prepare yourself so that you'll be well equipped, you see, study to show yourself approved unto God. You know what? A man may approve you. Your immediate uh, superior leaders may approve you, approve of what you're doing. And the people who see you, that you're jumping here and there, you're running up and down, they may approve of you. And they say he's doing a great work. Only God knows how faithful you are. And he says we should always have that in mind that we're going to give answer to the Lord on that final day. And so you're diligent and so you take it and so you look at the work he has given you. Study to show yourself approved unto God. A workman, that's still a watchman, a workman, an evangelist, a preacher, a leader, leading the people of God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly, properly, adequately, dividing the words of truth and giving unto them. We're looking at Second Corinthians chapter 6. Second Corinthians chapter 6, and I'm reading from verse 1. We then, as workers together with him, we then, as workers together with him, it says we're working with him. And he has, the, he has the plan of the work. He has the purpose of the work. And he knows the productivity. He knows what we ought to do. He knows where we ought to go. He knows the people we ought to be talking to. And because of that, we need to give ourselves knowing we're working with God. We're not just working with man. It says, we then, as workers together, within beseech you also that you receive not the grace of God in vain. The grace of God in your life will not be in vain. We're looking at uh, Isaiah chapter 52. Isaiah chapter 52. Talking to us, number one, we're workers together with God. Number two, we are workmen. Number three, we are watchmen. We're looking at Isaiah chapter 52. And here I'm reading from verse 7. Isaiah 52 verse 7 How beautiful are the, upon the mountains are the feet of him that bringeth good tidings. Good tidings, that's good news. Good tidings, that's the gospel. Good tidings are the message of redemption. That's the message of reconciliation. The message that we can be reconciled unto God. The message that although we have been in sin, here is Christ, the Son of God, our Redeemer. Here is the propitiation for our sins. And if we call Come to the Father through Him, we're going to be saved. And that good news, it says, the people who have that good news, they're not just staying somewhere, sitting somewhere, lying down somewhere, they're moving on. That's why it says, how beautiful are the feet of them that bringeth the good tidings. And then it says, uh, that publishes peace, that bringeth good tidings of good things, that publishes what? That publishes, tell me out aloud salvation you see that is talking about evangelists it's talking about soul winners it's talking about the people that bring the message of salvation the message of redemption and it brings that to the people that says unto zion thy god reigneth look at verse 8 now thy watchmen it's talking about the people that bring good news they are watchmen it's talking about the people that preach the word of salvation and it calls them thy watchmen it's talking about the people that tell us we don't have to perish in our sins christ died for us and because he died for us here is the good news we can be saved and it says we are watchmen thy watchmen shall lift up the voice with the voice together shall they sing, for they shall see 
eye to eye when the Lord shall bring again Zion. And then he goes on in verse 11, depart ye. If we're going to be fit for the work, it says, depart ye, depart ye, go ye out from things, touch no one, clean sin, go ye out of the midst of her, be ye clean that bear the vessels of the Lord. He's talking to us here tonight. We're going to be clean. Clean and prepared and ready to do the work he has given us to do in Jesus' name. I'm talking to you tonight on the rewardable ministry of a faithful watchman. The rewardable ministry. He will reward your ministry. The rewardable ministry of a faithful watchman. There are three points we're going to look at. Number one, the making of an evangelizing watchman. The making of an evangelizing watchman. A watchman that is evangelizing. A watchman that is reaching out to the lost and is telling them of the saving grace of God. A watchman that is going to sinners and is telling them, you don't have to perish because Jesus Christ died for you. He is our Savior. Is the final sacrifice. Is the substitute that the Heavenly Father has appointed and approved of. And you can come to God through Him. Watchmen evangelizing the making of an evangelizing watchman number two the ministry of an empowered witness we're also witnesses that's what jesus said you also be my witnesses because you have been with me from the very beginning and it says you shall receive power after that the holy ghost has come upon you and you shall be witnesses unto me both in jerusalem and judea and samaria and to the uttermost part of the earth that's what the apostles said and we are witnesses of these things because you are with him and i will tell you come to the lord the ministry of an empowered witness we have to have the power the energy the strength the courage and the boldness to declare the words of the lord point number three the marks of an earnest workman the marks of an earnest workman tell me number one the making of an evangelizing uh, Watchman. And let's come back to Ezekiel and see from the example of Ezekiel, from the pattern of Ezekiel, from the life and from the ministry of Ezekiel, how the Lord made him. Because the Lord said in Ezekiel chapter 3 verse 17, Son of man, I have made thee a watchman. I have made thee a watchman. You know, that's more than just, I have appointed you a watchman. Yes, appointed. I have anointed you as a watchman. I have equipped you as a watchman. I have enabled you as a watchman. I have made you. I have made you. I have created you. I've done something in you. I've given you everything it takes for you to be a watchman. The making of a watchman. I have made thee a watchman unto the house of Israel. Therefore hear the word at my mouth and give them warning from me. And we're looking at chapter 33 of Ezekiel. Ezekiel chapter 33. And here we're reading from verse 7. Ezekiel chapter 33 and we're reading from verse 7 here in verse 7 it says the for so thou son of man i have set thee a watchman unto the house of israel again i have set you i have set you i set you down uh, if you come to the new testament and you look at that word set when it says i have set you a watchman over the house of Israel. It says, therefore, thou shalt hear the words of my mouth and warn them from me. Well, we're coming to First Corinthians chapter uh, 12. First Corinthians chapter 12, I've set you and he has set you. Are you there? I said he has set you. In First Corinthians chapter 12, verse 18, but now as God said, members every one of them in the body as it has pleased him he set us he made us he called us he appointed us he anointed us he equipped us 
how did he do it for Ezekiel? And we need to understand what he says, I have made you a watchman. Not only to have appointed you, but I have done something that qualifies you. I have done something that prepares you. I have done something that equips you so that you will be an effective, capable watchman. You will be capable. You will be effective. And this work will prosper in your hands in Jesus' name. We're looking at Ezekiel now. How did God make this man? So then you'll be able to tell if God is going to make me an effective and evangelizing watch man. Here is what God is going to do. Ezekiel, I'm looking from chapter 2. Ezekiel chapter 2. And here we're reading from verse 1. Ezekiel chapter 2 verse 1 and he said unto me son of man stand upon thy feet and I will speak unto thee you know how God makes us he speaks to us you see a person that is not conversant with God not intimate with God not hearing the word of God not reading the word of God he cannot be an effective watchman an effective evangelist he says stand upon thy feet and i will speak unto thee look at verse 2 and the spirit entered into me and the spirit entered into me when he spake unto me if we read the word of god and the spirit does not breathe into us and the spirit does not energize us and the spirit does not enter into us the spirit of courage the spirit of the conqueror and the spirit of a captain and the spirit of a leader and the spirit of a person that goes in front and then is confidently telling the people follow me because i'm going in the right direction you see that's how god made ezekiel he heard the word from the mouth of the lord and then the spirit entered into him and set me upon my feet you know if you are not able to stand on your feet and you are wobbling you're not able to stand on your feet and you're a coward. You're not able to stand on your feet and stand for righteousness and stand for the truth. You're not able to stand for the heat, the heat of the day. You cannot be an evangelist. You cannot be a leader. You cannot be a preacher. He said, he set me on my feet that I heard him that spake unto me. Let's go to chapter 3. As we look at chapter 3, look at verses 8 and 9. How God made Ezekiel and how God is going to make you he'll make you make you an evangelist and make you a preacher and make you an effective leader a man or a woman in jesus name look at verse look at verse 8 behold i have made thy face strong against their faces i'm sure you know that uh, sinners sometimes manifest some kind of boldness bold faced Sometimes the people you want to bring to the Lord, they stand like that and it's like, uh, you know, they're ready for whatever you want to say. And God says, I know the people I've sent you to. And he said, Ezekiel, I have made thy face strong against their faces and thy forehead strong against their foreheads. And that's why you need to go to the Lord in prayer. If you have a timid nature, if you have a, a man-fearing nature, if you have the nature of, you know, you prepared your message, you have everything the Lord wants you to give to the people, everything is well prepared, you have prayed, you have done everything, and then you put everything line upon line, and precept to precept, and you have ordered everything, point one, point two, point three, and then conclusion. But when you come to the people, and then you see, you can tell their attitude on their faces. You can tell, it's okay, it's, Say there and say what you want to say. We're hearing you. Okay, we're there today. Talk now. As you look at their faces, it's like the brain becomes empty. The mind becomes empty. You forget whatever you wanted to say because they're intimidating. And they kind of inspire fear and timidity in you. God says, Ezekiel, I'm making you. He will make you. You will stand you will speak and you will declare the word of god without fear without favor in jesus name 
yes, we must be reasonable. Yes, we must be soft. Yes, we must be kind. Yes, we must be compassionate. But we must be truthful. We must be truthful. We must tell the people they have to repent. Without repentance, there's no remission of sin. Without repentance, there's no reconciliation with God. Without repentance, there is no, there is no salvation. We still have to tell them they repent. Tell them gently, but tell them. Tell them wisely, but tell them. Tell them softly, but tell them. Tell them convincingly that sinners must repent before they can come to the Lord. And the Lord said, Ezekiel, I know the people you are going to, and I'm going to make your face and your forehead as hard as their faces. Look at verse 9. As an adamant harder than flint, have I made thy forehead. Fear them not, neither be dismayed at their looks, though they be a rebellious house. The Lord will strengthen you. Strengthen you in the inner man. And then when you come and you declare the word of God, reasonably, peacefully, you are not fighting with anybody, but you are fighting sin. Somebody said, somebody there said, you are fighting sin. And you are fighting Satan that is holding them captive. And you are knocking the hand of Satan. And you are bringing those captives out of the hand of Satan in Jesus' name. It's something about Ezekiel. About the way that God made Ezekiel. Qualified Ezekiel. Equipped Ezekiel. Look at verse 26. In verse 26 of chapter 3. Chapter 3, verse 26. I will make thy tongue cleave to the roof of thy mouth that thou shalt be dumb and shall not be to them a reprover for they are rebellious as look at verse 27 but when i speak with thee i would open thy mouth you see there are people they don't know when to keep quiet they don't know when to talk they don't know what to be silent and when to shout. They don't know when to converse and when to communicate. They do not understand that if God is making you like an Ezekiel, a watchman, there are times he will just make you quiet, silent, dumb. You have nothing to say. And then you see what's going on. You see everything that is happening and you have nothing to say. And then God says, Ezekiel, I'm the one that does that. That's part of my process of making you. I need to let you know when to be quiet. I need to let you know when to be totally silent. But then when I speak to you and the target is there. When I speak to you and the prospects are there. When I speak to you and the lost people are there for you to open your mouth and then to talk to them, I myself i will open your mouth i pray god will do this for us you know we let we let out a lot of energy when we talk a lot of secrets in our minds when we talk and when and with a lot of power when we talk you can tell about some scene when he talked and talked and talked and talked eventually everything went but you see deep waters they flow quietly if you're quiet because there's no message now there's nothing to say now there's no ministry now there's nothing you're doing now and therefore you are quiet you are quiet you are meditating you are thinking about god you're thinking about the promises of god you're thinking about the possibility of what will happen when god gets right there to the field and then when the time comes for you to speak then you come out the power of god will flow through you the anointing that breaks the yoke will flow through your life in Jesus name verse 27 but when I speak with thee I will open thy mouth and thou shalt say unto them thus says the Lord God and he that heareth let him hear and he that forbeareth let him forbear for they are rebellious us. the making of an evangelizing watch we're looking at chapter 8 chapter 8 of Ezekiel Ezekiel chapter 8 I'm reading from verse 1 in Ezekiel chapter 8 verse 1 it says and it came to pass in the sixth year and in the six months and in the fifth day of the month as I sat in mine house and the elders of Judah sat before me that the hand of the Lord God fell there upon me fell there upon me the hand of the Lord fell there upon me this is the making of this evangelizing watchman you know there are people they do not know what we call the anointing resting on them 
the anointing falling upon them. Our lives many times, I'm talking generally now, our lives many times are just like, uh, you know, straight lines. And it's just like moving on like that. As you felt yesterday, so you're feeling today. As you were last week, so you are today. Your life is normal. Your life is predictable. It's like, uh, you know, you are like the same every time. But in the case of Ezekiel, he said, you know, I sat in my house. And the elders of Judah came to me. And as they came to me, I was wondering, what am I going to do with them? What am I going to tell them? All of a sudden, I felt the weight of the supernatural touch. And the hand of the Lord fell on me. Not just, not just that it touched me, it fell there upon me. I pray that you will experience the power of God. The hand of God The strength of the Lord And when that hand came upon him That's coming to strengthen him That's coming to prepare him And that's coming to make him say Whatever those elders are going to ask I'm here with you I'm in partnership with you I'm your companion I will never leave you I will strengthen you And the word of God will come fully out of your mouth In Jesus name I'm looking at chapter 11 verse 5 Chapter 11 we're looking at verse 5 Yes, it's still telling us about the making of Ezekiel. The making of Ezekiel. In verse 5 it says, The Spirit of the Lord fell upon me. Hold on. You see a man like this, uh, sometimes the hand of the Lord came upon him. The Spirit of the Lord fell upon him. Uh, and then the Lord spoke unto him. Or the Spirit entered into him. Uh, no wonder he was successful. No wonder there was no time he was saying, I'm discouraged now. I'm tired now. I don't think I can do anything now. The challenges are too many for me. And uh, the uphill task is so much. I don't know whether I can climb that mountain or not. The hand of the Lord was present there every time. And then the Spirit of the Lord was whispering within him. And the Spirit of the Lord fell upon him in verse 5. And then he goes on to say, it says, Thus says the Lord. Thus have you said, O house of Israel, for I know the things that come into your mind, every one of them. We're coming to chapter 37 verse 1. Chapter 37, we're looking at uh, verse 1. In verse 1 it says, The hand of the Lord was upon me, and he carried me out in the spirit of the Lord, and set me down in the midst of the valley of dry bones. Then he goes on to say, look at verse 10, So I prophesied according as he commanded me. I prophesied according as he commanded me. I preached as he commanded me. I preached as he commanded me. I proclaimed as he commanded me. I said what he told me to say. No wonder he was successful. If the Lord is talking to you every time, every time you are before a man, every time you are before a woman, every time you are before the youth, every time you are before a child, and then the Lord is ministering to you. It's not just that you know what you have had in your head, in your mind, after all these many years you repeat exactly the same thing you say exactly the same thing and you roll out exactly the same thing and the people who are listening say I had that before, I knew that before that's what he always says but the spirit of God comes upon you and the word of the Lord comes out of your mouth and reaches out to them souls are going to get saved through you and the power of God will walk through you in Jesus' name. Only God by Spirit through Christ can make us faithful. Because fearless, because fruitful, because fervent, and because forthright, evangelizing watchmen like Ezekiel. You understand? Snatching captives from Satan's kingdom. That's a difficult job. That's not the work of man. It's the work of God. Taking the prey from the den of strong men. The strong men holding them tight, holding them captive. That's going to take supernatural power. Breaking the habits of depravity. What he brought into this world. That man has been practicing that evil thing for the last 40, 45 years. And now you want to break that habit of depravity. It's going to take something you know, more than human. And then holding slippery sinners and pulling them out of the slimy pitch. 
the sinners are slippery. You want to hold them here, they slip out your hand. You want to hold them there, they slip out of your hand. And holding those people who are slippery, and then pulling them out of the slimy pit, it's going to take the power of God. It's, it's beyond what you can do by yourself. Opening the eyes of those who love their blindness. It's one thing for a blind man to say, I want to receive my sight. It's another thing for a blind man to close his eyes and say, no, I don't want to see. Look at this. No, I don't want to see. Look at hell. I don't want to see that. And look at the grace of God. I don't want to see that. And they close their minds. And they close their eyes and they say I prefer to be blind I don't want to see anything for you to open the eyes of the people deliberately habitually make themselves blind and they love their blindness that's a difficult task that's why we need the spirit of God and the power of the Lord making the deaf who cherishes uh, his deafness to hear the man is deaf, he's not hearing at all, and he's not hearing the word of God. And say, Come on, hear the word of God. He say, I don't want to hear, I love my deafness because what I don't know will not bother me, what I don't hear will not uh, convict me, what I don't know will not pose any problem to me. I like my ignorance, I cherish my ignorance, I prefer to remain deaf. How are you going to talk to them? It takes the power of the Spirit of God to break that thing. He'll break it in Jesus' name. You want to awaken somebody, wake somebody up that is sleeping in the fool's paradise. It's just, it says, I'm happy the way I am. Everything is all right. You think uh, I'm not all right, and you think I'm going to hell. I don't feel that. I don't sense that. God is too good to throw anybody to hell. I just know I'm having a nice time here. See what he has given me. If the Lord wasn't happy with me, look at this, look at this, look at this. And the man is living, the woman is living in fool's paradise. And you want to wake him up and get stirred up and get ready because judgment is coming. Only God can make you an effective preacher, a fervent preacher. A faithful preacher, a person that will be able to wake up all those people, and the Lord will make you. I, I, I want to hear your amen. amen. Look at Psalm some, some 104, Psalm 104. I'm reading from verse 4. It says, Who maketh his angel spirit? He maketh them, maketh them. Who maketh his angel spirit? And then his ministers a flaming fire. He'll do it for you. I said, He'll do it for you. Isaiah chapter 41 Isaiah chapter 41 In the process of making What he does and what he will do For you. Thank God you are here tonight The power of God will come upon your life He will shake everything Shakeable out of your life In Jesus name. In Isaiah chapter 41 I'm reading from verse 15 Isaiah chapter 41 verse 15 Behold I will make thee A new sharp threshing Instrument having tears I thought my people would say, Amen. Amen. Behold, I will make thee a new sharp threshing instrument having teeth, and thou shalt thresh the mountains, and beat them small, and shalt make the hills as chaff. Thou shalt fan them, and the wind shall carry them away, and the whirlwind shall scatter them, and thou shalt rejoice in the Lord, and thou shalt glory in the Holy One of Israel. You will have the joy of service, the joy of fulfillment, and the joy of fruitfulness in Jesus' name. Is there at Jeremiah chapter 51? Jeremiah chapter 51. We're reading from verse 20, very important verse of scripture. Jeremiah chapter 51, verse 20. Can I read? I said, Have you opened it? Jeremiah chapter 51 reading from verse 20 look at what it says over here it says thou art my battle axe thou art my battle axe all the almighty said almighty God said those lofty trees I need to cut down and I'm going to use you and those uh, trees that are just occupying the ground for naught, I'm going to cut them with the axe. The axe is laid to the root of the tree. And you are that axe. I pray your axe will not be blunt. You'll be sharp. 
and then you will cut and then all those seeds in their branches will cut away from them in Jesus name thou art my battle ass and weapons of war for with thee will I break in pieces the nations and with thee will I destroy the kingdoms of darkness he will do it for you and he will do it through you because our sufficiency is in God. Our sufficiency is in Christ. In 2 Corinthians chapter 3, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, I'm reading here from verse 5. Not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything as of ourselves, but our sufficiency is of God. Make it personal. My sufficiency is of God. Say it aloud. My sufficiency is of God. You'll find him sufficient. His grace will be sufficient for you. His power will be sufficient for you. And the holding hand of the Lord will be sufficient for you in Jesus' name. Who also has made us able ministers of the New Testament. He has made us. He has made us. Your own time has come. He will make you in Jesus' name. Point number two now. The ministry of an empowered witness. The ministry of an empowered witness. We're coming to Micah chapter Three. Micah chapter 3 We need the power of God Because it is that power That will make us do What we need to do Otherwise the challenges of ministry The things you ought to say And the people you need to confront You will not be able to do that If you didn't have the power Of the Holy Ghost in your life Micah chapter 3 I'm reading from verse 8 It says but truly but truly, but certainly, honestly, but uh, without any shadow of doubt, I am full of power by the Spirit of the Lord. I am full of power by the Spirit of the Lord. You want to go out to the evangelism? Why don't you check out? I am full of power by the Spirit of the Lord. You want to go and hold a crusade? Why don't you check up? I am full of power by the Spirit of the Lord. You want to go and preach? To believers, you want to stir them up. You want to encourage them. You want to lift them up. You want to strengthen their backbone so that they become uncompromising in their lives. You want to check up that you are full of the power of the Spirit of God. You want to find out first that the Spirit of God is there. The Spirit has entered into you. The Spirit has come upon you. The Spirit has empowered you. The Spirit has conquered you totally. Has conquered that uh, kind of uh, fearfulness in you. Has conquered that spirit of uh, the coward in you. And full of power by the Spirit of the Lord. Look at this. Of judgment and of might. To declare to Jacob his transgression. To declare unto Jacob his transgression. You know, because uh, all those people, they say, we are the children of Abraham. And we know the Lord already. And yet they are living in sin. And the Lord is saying, go tell them and go convince them that they are living in sin. And if they died in their sins, they will perish. And they will spend eternity in hellfire forever. And you need to be full of the power of the Spirit of God before that can happen. I pray you will have the Spirit of God. And let me show you situations where you must have the Spirit of God before you can confront these sinners and before you can confront the people that are living in their sins and rejoicing in their sins. In Second Samuel, I'm reading from chapter 12. Second Samuel, chapter 12, and we're reading here from verse 7. Second Samuel, chapter 12, we're looking at verse 7. And Nathan said to David, Thou art the man. How do you confront a man like David? A man that was a king. A man that was so mighty and powerful. And a man that had done what he did and he didn't even feel any qualm, any kind of, uh, you know, pricking of the conscience about that. He had killed Urias, had taken the wife, and now the wife is pregnant and is living happily together with the woman. And now you are to confront that individual. You need the power of the Spirit of God. And you need the courage of the Spirit of God in you and Nathan came to David yes as we said before yes you are going to apply wisdom yet you are going to apply some you know understanding yet you are going to have some kind of communication ability but then you must still confront the sinner and after he told him the parable and then David commented about the parable and then he looked at him eyeball to eyeball he said thou art the man 
We need that courage. I said we need that courage. Otherwise, you'll be avoiding those backsliders. You'll be avoiding those uh, sinners. You'll say, I don't want to get into trouble. I know these people. I know what a man like that that could make arrangements and then uh, he killed uh, the husband of this woman, made all the arrangements. This man is, uh, you know, you know what he be, where he belongs to. And since he could do that, I don't want to endanger my life. Your life cannot be endangered. If you are the path of duty, if you are doing what the Lord has called you to do, all the enemies put together all over the world, they cannot touch your life. You are unconquerable until you finish your ministry. And you will finish. I said you will finish. And you will finish well in Jesus' name. Let's, let's look at this now. In the first, first Kings chapter 21. First Kings chapter 21, I'm reading here from verse 17. Here's another situation now. We need courage, but it's not the human courage. It's not the kind of animal courage. It's not the carnal courage. It's the courage of the Spirit of God. You're saved, and the Spirit of God bears witness upon the game. You're sanctified, and the Spirit of God bears witness that you are eternally sanctified, purified, and made holy. And then you are baptized in the Holy Ghost and you have this power of the Holy Ghost within you see what it will do in First Kings I'm reading from chapter 21 chapter 21 I were looking at verse 17 in verse 17 and the word of the Lord came to Elisha the teach by sin arise go down to meet Ahab king of Israel which is in Samaria behold he is in the vineyard of Naboth whither he is gone down to possess it and thou shalt speak unto him saying thus says the Lord as thou killed and also taking uh, uh, taking possession and thou shalt speak to him saying thus says the Lord Thus says the Lord. You know, when people are just uh, coming back from where they have committed sin, they are coming back from where they have just done evil, they are coming back where they have just manifested their greed, and they have taken the vineyard of another person of neighbor, and the Lord says, go confront him and go talk to him and go tell him that if he dies in that condition he is going to perish look at middle of verse 19 thus says the lord in the place where dogs leak the blood of nabot shall dogs leak thy blood even thine and remember who he had was he was a king and remember he had a powerful wife mighty wife terrorizing wife are the wife that could run you out of town and then god said elijah go and tell that man and you know that uh, Je jezebel was behind all this plot and everything that uh, he had did at this time and yet god sent him elijah to such a man when he sent such on an errand he'll back us up he'll support us he'll put the words in your mouth He'll put the courage in your heart. You will succeed in Jesus' name. Look at uh, verse 20. And he has said to Elijah, As thou found me, tell me. Uh, that's, that's what they say, to put us up, not to talk, to shut us down. Uh-huh, it's coming. You have something to say. I know you don't love me. I know you don't like me. Have you found me, oh my enemy? And Elijah did not say, I'm not your enemy. Elijah did not, you know, give excuses. I'm not your enemy. I love you now. I'm a child of God. I'm a man of God. I love everybody. I'm trying to tell you something for your good. And it's not the time for a conversation like that. If he calls you enemy, it's because of the Lord. And whatever title they give you, forget about that title and stand right there and do the work the Lord has given you to do. You will do it. I said you will do it. It takes the power of the Holy Ghost to do all that God has commanded us to do. As thou found me, O my enemy, and he answered, I have found thee, I have found thee, I have found thee, because thou hast sold thyself to work even in the sight of the Lord. Behold, I will bring evil upon thee. 
and will take away thy posterity and will cut off from Ahab him that pisseth against the wall and him that is shut up and let in Israel. And then he goes on to say, and will make thine house like the house of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, and like the house of Beersha, the son of Ahijah, for the provocation wherewith thou hast provoked me to anger and made Israel to sin. And of Jezebel, and of Jezebel also spake the Lord, saying, The dog shall eat Jezebel by the word of Jezreel. Him that dieth of Ahab in the city, the dog shall eat, and him that dieth in the field shall the fowls of the air eat. And, and then he says, But there was none like unto Ahab which did sell himself to work wickedness in the sight of the Lord. Tell me. Tell me at Allah, one, two, three, go. You know some men, they don't have any mind of their own. They don't have any backbone. They don't have any strength of character to say, I've been called of God. I'm the king over here, and this is what the Lord wants. And they said, Jezebel came from foreign lands, and he will dictate to Ahab what to do every time. And the man, although he had the title, he didn't have the character, he didn't have the courage. I pray you'll not be like that. That you're always taking permission from your wife. Uh, I, I want to go and preach repentance. Can I, my dear? I want to tell sinners to repent. Do you permit me? I want to tell believers to stand firm. Would you allow me? Are you like that? Ah, look at them there. I said, are you like that? You'll not be like that in Jesus' name. And our sisters, you'll not be like Jezebel. So that, you know, when your husband, would, you know, you will go to church and then that day the word of God comes strong. And then your husband, you're looking at your husband, pointing at that one. If you don't repent, eternity is waiting for you. And that man there, you're back saying you have committed secret sin and this has happened. And if you don't repent, the judgment of God is coming fearfully upon you. And now we're going to pray everybody rise up today. No body going to the toilet today we're going to call on the name of the lord that backsliding spirit the lord will drive it away and then you finish like that you are sweating already because you know the power of the lord really came upon you and then you come to the house and uh, you know your wife says well done <laughs> today what happened to you i was watching you as if uh, i even thought you are going to point at me as so you are pointing and then you say i'm sorry what are you sorry for you're sorry for the Spirit of God coming upon you. You're sorry for being bold against Ahab and against Jezebel. That sorry, sorry kind of speech will get out of you in Jesus' name. That we will stand on the word of the Lord and no Jezebel will run you out of ministry in Jesus' name. Hey, look at this now. It says in verse 25, For Jezebel his wife stood him up, and he did very abominably, following idols according to all the things, as did the Amorites, whom the Lord cast out before the children of Israel. And it came to pass, this is wonderful, look at this, and it came to pass when he had heard those words, that he rent his clothes. And put her clothes upon his flesh, and went and then fasted, and lay in her clothes. Tell me the rest. And he went softly. What if Elijah was timid? What if Elijah was fearful? What if Elijah could not declare the words of the Lord? I am full of power by the Spirit of the Lord to declare unto Jacob his transgression. The Lord will help you. We're looking at Isaiah chapter 58. Isaiah chapter 58. I'm reading here from verse 1. Isaiah chapter 58 verse 1. It says, Cry aloud, fear not. Lift up thy voice like a trumpet and show my people their transgression and the house of Jacob their sins. It says, Cry aloud. Lift up your voice, make it like a trumpet. It says, Yea, they seek me daily, 
and delight to know my ways, as a nation that did righteousness, and forsook not the ordinance of their God. They ask of me the ordinances of justice, and they take the light in approaching unto God. It says all the same. Although they have the appearance and the superficial a kind of a testimony and worship, that they were worshiping the Lord, yet they will not obey the watch of the Lord. So lift up your voice and cry out. Lift it up like a trumpet. Let the Spirit of the Lord grant you boldness. Tonight, a change will come in your life. A change will come in your heart. And your life will speak the word of God and do the work of God faithfully and fully in Jesus' name. Acts of the Apostles chapter 4, I'm reading from verse 29. Acts of the Apostles chapter 4 verse 29 And now Lord behold their threatenings And grant unto thy servants That with all boldness That's it With all boldness They may speak thy word With all boldness They may speak thy word By stretching forth thy hand to heal, and that signs and wonders may be done by the name of thy holy child, Jesus. That's what he wants you to do. He wants you to declare the word of God without fear, without favor, without the spirit of the coward, and without the spirit of a cringing preacher. You declare that word faithfully, forcefully, yes, wisdom, yes, gentleness, yes, love, yes, compassion, but they must be convinced of their sins, convicted of their sins, and then they come to know the Lord. We're coming to Ephesians chapter uh, 6. Ephesians chapter 6, I'm reading from verse 19. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 19. And it says, And for me, that utterance may be given unto me, that I may open my mouth, how? Boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel that for which I am an ambassador in bonds, that therein I may speak. How do you speak? Boldly as I ought to speak. Speak against sin, do it boldly. Speak against compromise, do it boldly. Speak against the evil of the land, do it boldly. Speak, speak against compromise and do it boldly. And that's what the Lord expects of us. Our assignment demands an inner strength greater than our natural ability. Our assignment, our duty demands uh, something that is beyond natural skill because, you know, natural skill cannot achieve supernatural feats. Human training alone cannot transform hearts of stone. We need the power of the Holy Ghost. We need His presence. We need His power. We need His pungency. We need His pleadings and persuasion. We need a possession of us. Only that will make us effective witnesses for Christ. How we need the power, the might, and the boldness of the Spirit today. The Lord will do it in us. We come to point number three now. The marks of an earnest workman. The marks of an earnest workman. If we're really working for the Lord and doing the work the way He wants us to do it, what's the result? What comes as a consequence of that work in our ministry? We're coming to Daniel chapter 12, verse 3. Daniel chapter 12, and we're reading from verse 3. It says in verse 3, And they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament, and they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. Turn many unto righteousness. That's what we do. That's what we do. It's not just to preach. It's not just to teach. It's not just to occupy time and just stay there on the pulpit. You turn the people away from sin unto the Savior, away from darkness unto the light, and away from evil unto the goodness of God, you turn them away from unrighteousness, and you turn them to righteousness. That's the mark 
of a real child of God, a real preacher of the gospel. Malachi chapter 2. Malachi chapter 2. I'm reading from verse 5. It says in verse 5, My covenant was with him of life and peace and i gave them to him for the fear wherewith he feared me i was afraid before my name look at this the law of truth was in his mouth and iniquity was not found in him he walked with me in peace and equity and tell me tell me out loud did turn many away from iniquity. That's a ministry. Whatever it is you're doing in the church or outside the church, on the evangelistic field, or you're ministering to the body of Christ, you turn many away from iniquity. We're coming to Acts of the Apostles, chapter 26. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 26. We're reading from verse 16. Acts chapter 26, reading from verse 16. Here's what it says. But rise and stand upon thy feet. For I have appeared unto thee for this purpose, to make thee a minister. Make thee a minister is the one who makes us, is the one who equips us, is the one who qualifies us, is the one that energizes us, empowers us. It says to make thee a minister and a witness both of these things which thou hast seen and of those things in the which I will appear unto thee. Verse 17, delivering thee from the people and from the Gentiles unto whom I now send thee and it says to open their eyes god will help you and then tell me the next thing there to turn them from darkness to light. that turning that turning that transformation must be there that's what we're doing you go to those sinners and you're turning them away from the world away from their idols and away from their sin and you're turning them to the lord turning them from darkness onto the light if your ministry does not do that you're not an evangelist if you say i'm talking to the sinners you pet them you entertain them you encourage them you do whatever you pray for them but they don't turn from their wickedness, from their evil. That's not evangelism. And when you come to the church and people are cold and people are lethargic and people are lukewarm and people are careless and people are backsliding and you're not turning them away from that backsliding. That's not pastoral work. If you're doing pastoral work, there's a turning, there's a transformation and there's a transparency about their lives. It says to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them, which are sanctified by faith that is in me. From today, the Lord will keep you. And you will do this work faithfully in Jesus' name. Hey, let's look at one verse that summarizes everything uh, the Lord wants you to do. Look at this in Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1. I'm reading from verse 28. Colossians chapter 1. And we're looking at uh, verse uh, 28. Who we preach, warning every man. Who we preach, warning uh, every man. It says every man you come across, if you are on the emergency field, you are warning them. Escape from the judgment to come. And if it's in the church, you are warning them. Don't be careless. Don't go back to sin. Let not the righteous person leave his righteousness and fall back into sin. You are warning them. You are warning every man. You are warning every woman. You are warning the youth. You are warning the adults. You are warning the children. You are warning the singles. You are warning the married. It says you are warning every man that we may present. Tell me. That we may present, tell me, every man perfect in Christ Jesus. Christ is coming. And because we know he's coming again, you want to have the joy of presenting the people you're teaching, presenting them unto Christ perfect. What does that mean? 
repeat there means you want to present him pure before the Lord. Pure before the Lord. And because if it's not pure, it's not perfect. If it's not pure, it's not going to see the Lord. Because we're told in Matthew chapter 5, here in verse 8, Matthew chapter 5, and in verse 8 it says, Blessed at the pure in heart, for they shall see God. You want them to see God on the final day. That's why you're preaching. That's why you're teaching. That's why you're warning them. That we may present every man pure in the sight of the Lord. If there is to be established. You're preaching so that people are establishing the faith. They're establishing righteousness. It's not like, you know, you preach last Sunday. And the people pray the kind of prayer. By the time you come back this Sunday again. They're back to square one. They're back to those evil things again. They're established in the faith. We're looking at Acts of the Apostles, chapter 16, verse 5. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 16, and we're looking at verse 5. That when the Lord will come, the people you are preaching to, the people you are teaching, they'll be established in the faith. That's what it says, presenting them pure. Presenting them established in verse 5 of Acts chapter 16. And so what the church is established in the faith. Established in the faith and increased in number daily. Not only that, you want to present them righteous. Righteous. That's, that's it. Because when Christ comes, the people will be looking for when he says perfect, pure. When it says perfect, establish. When it says perfect, righteous. In Matthew chapter 13, verse 43. Matthew chapter 13, we're looking at verse 43. The people that will make it on the final days, expecting them uh, that there will be righteousness in their lives. Chapter 13 of Matthew, verse 43. They shall the righteous shine uh, forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father who has ears to hear. Let him hear. And so you want to make sure that your teaching, your preaching, your encouragement, your counseling, your ministry, whatever it is you are doing, is to present them perfect unto the Lord when he comes. Perfect, pure, perfect, established, perfect, righteous. F means faultless, faultless. In Jude verse 24, Jude we're looking at verse 24. You don't want to gloss over any fault. You don't want to gloss over any blemish. You want, don't want to gloss over any kind of thing in the lives of the people and say, well, the people are like that. And since they're like that, I don't know what I'm going to do again. Oh, you, have, you know what you're going to do. You're going to preach until those flaws and those things are taken away from their lives. And you point them to the fountain of the blood of Jesus that will take all those flaws away so that when he comes, you'll present them before the Lord pure, present them before the Lord established, present them before the Lord righteous, and present them before the Lord tell me faultless. We're looking at verse 24 now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory uh, with exceeding joy to the only wise God our Savior be glory and majesty dominion and power both now and forever Amen, Amen. and then you want to present them enduring till the end enduring till the end you don't want to just whip up emotion of the people and then they say, well, praise the Lord, we are restored, we are restored to the Lord. Praise the Lord, we have returned to the Lord. But they cannot endure. Temptations will come, trials will come, challenges will come in their places of, in their places of work. And they cannot endure to the end. You want to make sure that whatever you are doing, you want to present them perfect before the Lord, that means pure. Perfect before the Lord, that means, uh, that means they are established. Perfect before the Lord, they are righteous, they are faultless, they are enduring. Matthew chapter 24. In Matthew chapter 24, here we are reading from verse 12. Matthew chapter 24, we are reading from verse 12. It says, and because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall was cold, but he that shall, tell me, endure. 
endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. You don't want to just labor and labor and preach and run up and run down. And then the people are not standing. They cannot stand until the final day. But they endure to the very end. But the end see there is to be Christ-like. That, that's our goal. That's the goal of ministry. You want to reproduce Christ in them. You want to make sure that their lives are just reflections of the Lord Jesus Christ. Christ-like. That means that uh, you were preaching and warning everyone that we might present everyone Christ-like until the time when Christ shall come. We're looking at First John chapter 2. First John chapter 2 and I'm reading here from verse 6. First John chapter 2 verse 6. He that says he abided in him ought himself also so to walk even as he walked. Ought himself so to walk even as he walked. Look at chapter 3 verse 3. And every man that has this opinion purified himself even as he is pure. You want to present the people Christ-like you want to present them triumphant, triumphant. That temptations come, they triumph. Difficulties come, they triumph. And whatever it is that comes their way, they triumph. That, that's what will make our ministry to bear fruit. In Revelation chapter 3, I'm reading from verse 11 and verse 12. Revelation chapter 3. We're reading from verse 11. Behold, I come quickly. Hold that fast which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. He that overcometh, that's triumphing. I will overcome. I said, I will overcome. He, him that overcometh, will I make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go no more out, and I will write upon him the name of my God, and the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God, and I will write upon him my new name in revelation chapter 21 verse 7 to be triumphant triumphant it tells us in revelation chapter 21 verse 7 he that overcometh shall inherit all things and i will be his god and he shall be my son you know if you're teaching and preaching you're sweating you're going up and down but you're not preparing the people to be overcomers to overcome sin to overcome the world to overcome the flesh overcome the devil you're just you know teaching and preaching and teaching and preaching we love our pastor you know he encourages us and they are living defeated lives and their lives and shambles uh, out there what's the reward but when you want to present them perfect present them pure present them established and present them righteous and present them faultless and present them enduring till the end present them christ-like present them triumphant then on the final day the lord will say well done i gave you that work to do i made you a faithful fervent a fruitful watchman and you were a watchman i pray you'll be a watchman a watchman that will be rewarded on the final day in jesus name we need the power of the Spirit of God in our lives, and the Lord will do it. I said the Lord will do it. We we'll get saved, we we'll get sanctified, and then we're immersed in the Spirit, empowered in by the Spirit, energized by the Spirit, enveloped by the Spirit, and then we go forth to do the work He has called us to do. We will prosper in the work in Jesus' name. Let's rise up and tell the Lord we're really going to pray today that God will make us the kind of watchmen we ought to be, and the kind of workmen we ought to be, and the kind of witnesses we ought to be. Open your mouth and talk to the Lord in prayer.